Chief Nyamudo, the present general of Ohanez and Dibo. That was quite an excursion into the good old days and a barrage of very useful ideas and suggestions for us and of course for our leaders going forward after this pandemic. We On behalf of consciousness to awaken our people. Yes, we need, the issue we need leadership something only government and expansion of the mind. Of course, you people see. People like you also who have such a... Um, I have talked about this everywhere. I mentor, I give convocation lectures. And, you know, I'm two years away to 70. There's a, a limit of what I can do now. Do you think that uh, starving of universities is also part of the problem? Because every year they keep... Um, Lamenting about there are too many universities. If you ask, there are too many universities. You know, it is not how many universities you have, but how many are productive. You know, you see somebody who comes out of a university and he cannot write correct English. You employ him; he's in area of endowment, and you see he's he read computer science, but he doesn't know how to program. He just carries a certificate which has no productive capacity. It's not building so many universities, but the educational content of the university. What is our synergy with other countries of the world? When I was in university, our lecturers went on sabbatical. They went to teach in other jurisdictions because they were producing ideas that were attractive in other jurisdictions. And there was a miscegenation of knowledge. There was a cross-fertilization. They go there, they learn the ones we are developing, we learn the ones they are developing. And then there's a growth of ideas, you know. There is no growth of ideas in our country. You know, the only pastime you have now is to find a real big artist here where you can go and take a local culinary. Right, you know, and young people. you see, I mean, that's, that's all it is. When a child, I went to watch films here. Yeah. I trekked from what is the new market now to Cold Camp to watch films. Eventually, there was another cinema hall in Zika Avenue. We went there. Eventually, there was one in sports club. We went there. I watched Macbeth. I watched Julius Caesar while I was reading them in secondary school. So I had a pictorial illustration of the book I was reading. And I understood it better. Ideas don't grow on unfertile minds, on unfertile environment. You have to create an environment for an idea to grow. The children have to be impatient for production and for growth. We have children who are energetic and willing to work but we are not giving them the tools to do so. And we are recognizing people, not because of their contribution to society, but because of their aggrandizement of society. So the emblems of achievement that spur people on to become something is jaundiced, is upside down. Terrible, not, not so much. After Corona virus, and um, let me just use ravages, but I pray it doesn't happen like that over here. Uh, do you think we'll be able to recover again in terms of uh, economy, because if, if it drags for so long, nobody knows how it will all end. The US, for instance, has brought out some sort of um, stimulus package. I don't know if our country has started deploying theirs effectively. Do you see anything changing at all in finance as well? You know, if we recover from the health hazard, we will then, the trajectory of attention will change to the economics. Right now, we're a broke nation. Because against a budgeted capacity of $57 a barrel, oil has fallen to 20 25 27 It's fluctuating every day, depending on the war between the Soviet Union and Saudi Arabia, in terms of flooding the market with produce. And Saudi Arabia doesn't mind because it is a very large producer. You know, I mean, uh, America produces 12 million barrels of shale oil every day. And Saudi Arabia produces something like 9.7. And Saudi Arabia doesn't mind upping up the quantity in the market because it, it doesn't matter how low the price is, it will still have a gargantuan return. The high seas in the world are warehouses now. There are ships containing vessels containing crude oil that nobody is demanding for. What does that mean? Our earning as a country is down. And don't forget, we have a debt profile that is very high, which we must pay. So whatever savings we have now is going to be deported to pay off our debts. Now, we are not earning new money. The cost of production of one barrel of crude oil by NNPC is $17. So if we are if selling it at $20, we're only getting a net income of about $2. After all, the shipping services and stuff have taken on. Or nothing. If we get $2, they will look for restructuring by force. Now. What will the federal government be sitting to allocate revenue to? It's a waste of time. So every state should go home and husband his resources to the best of his ability and export those it can export. Oil is no longer Father Christmas. 
we are going to go into a serious economic crisis. Many of the federal ministries and establishments will be closed because there is no capacity to meet the recurrent expenditure. You can't pay the salaries. Already pensions are not paid as and when due. So with this unprecedented drop of expected revenue, what are you going to face? A broke pension. Public services will die. The roads that have been awarded, very soon you will not find any contractor on the road. Because once they finish the money they have been given, if there's no new money, it's gone. What are the new areas of production that we are catalyzing for export? In the last four years, our non-oil income has remained on the same level of percentage. It has not increased or decreased. So there is no new wealth coming from non-oil resources. What kind of country? We have been fighting a war on the Boko Haram front which is taking us billions of dollars. And you see no new equipment bought. These things are going into the pockets of people. GOCs have been arrested in Kaduna Airport, carrying so much money, and you don't see any prosecution in court. There's one law for some people, another law for others. This country is immersed in a lot of problems, and it requires drastic leadership. You can't take me where you do not know. Look at how much a legislator earns in Nigeria. What is the quantum of job that he does that requires such a monument to be paid to him? I mean, something is fundamentally wrong. I hope that COVID-19 shocks us into a realization that we've been wasting our potentialities for a long time and brings out, amongst you people who are young, the correct leadership. This country has enormous resources. We could be greater than China, but we have the wrong leadership the wrong orientation. We have been reminded of our ethnic cleavages. Look, if you go to Yoruba land now, you find a lot of Igbo women who are married there. And there are Yoruba women who are married here. If you go to the north, the same thing, at the end of the war, it became a status symbol for every general to marry an Igbo woman. We have so mixed, the miscegenation is so much that these ethnic divisions that we have now are going to have a tool on products of mixed marriages. Children whose mothers are Igbo and they are married to Fulanese are going to begin to ask themselves, do I really have anything to do with my mother's home? Or do I hate my father's home because of the way they have used religion and militancy to attack the rest of Nigeria? We don't need this. A Katsina man called Umaru Altini was elected mayor of Enugu by adult suffrage. He defeated an Igbo man to become mayor there. And Zeke campaigned for him. Mr. Willoughby, a Yoruba man, was accountant general of Eastern Nigeria. Yeah. A Calabar woman won an election in Aba as a member of the Eastern Nigerian House of Assembly, Margaret Ebo. Nobody wanted to know where you come from. I live in Imoke Street. Dr. S. Imoke was Minister of Education. My first school living certificate is signed by Dr. S. Imoke. He's from Itigiri, yeah. His children are my very close friends. They lived in 8 Park Avenue. We lived in 10 Park Avenue. They lived in 12 independence land. We lived in 13. My father lived where the deputy governor lives now. And the presidential guest house op opposite it was uh, Dr. S. Imoke's residence as Minister of Information. These things haven't changed. Why haven't we built new ministerial quarters? Some of them have been monetized by politicians and they're occupying them today. Aggrandizement of public wealth in order to encourage self esteem of a uh, monstrous character that destroys the capacity to develop. Unfortunately, the voices of reason have been silenced, both the young and the old. And we will remain in this quagmire for a long time. It's very painful that what is happening elsewhere is not shocking our imagination into compliance. It seems to me that our people are waiting for people to begin to die like mosquitoes or flies before they realize that COVID-19 is real. Sometimes they tell you that it's a rich man's sickness, that it's affecting governors and so on. Look, this is an airborne disease, and you say it's for rich men. Well, if it affected the chief of staff to the president, it also affected the staff of the chief of staff. Many of them tested positive. The good thing is that people are responding to treatment, but we haven't even found out. Those who have recovered from it, do they have a permanent disability that raises a question mark about their longevity? Will they now have a permanent defect in their lungs that will make it difficult for them to have a ripe old age? or to undertake strenuous activities that require intensive breathing. Have we found out this? And people say, oh, they recover. So we are waiting for the worst case scenario to shock our imagination. 
does not think that it is necessary to carry water first thing in the morning because you don't have a dry throat first thing in the morning. But at the moment you till the soil and the sun comes, you have a dry throat. And you remember, I would have taken water. So you see women who are going to weed in the farm, they carry the food they will eat, they carry the water they will drink. The men carry some palm wine and they carry some yam that they are going to roast and some palm oil. Because they know that after some time, energy would have been expended. You will need water, you will need food, you will need replenishment in order to be able to walk the long distance home. We are lucky. For the first time in the world, the advantaged section of the world is the one that is suffering most. And we have capacity to know this by instrument of public education. Mass communication has enabled us to know, in real life situation, the degree of mortality in those advantage areas. But it's not shocking our imagination. They think it's not our portion. See, our country does not promote the son of a poor man who has talent and something to offer society. The poor remain perpetually poor in Nigeria. And children must be asking their parents, are we cost? And that is the incentive for crime. That is why a mother does not mind when his child goes to Malaysia and is involved in cocaine and comes home with so much money and is sharing dollars openly. Tell me, isn't it a madman who gets so much money and comes to a public function, a social event, and is throwing $100 bills? And the government sees it and they do nothing about it. He's not a suspect. He's not an object for investigation. Isn't this the collapse of governance? As I am raging and about to die, I am in great agony that the values are plummeted, and that our children may never attain our heights if something drastic doesn't. I don't know if I'm the John the Baptist in the wilderness. I don't know whether I'm the only one who is seeing what I'm seeing. I see doom. I see starvation coming. The old one is gone. And we have no productive sector ready to take over. China doesn't have oil. It uses our oil to catalyze its machines in our factories. But it is the world power. They are the greatest buyer of our oil now. So all we wait is to dig oil from the ground. We don't even process it. We don't add any value to it. Even the one that we should add value to make our machines work, produce kerosene, produce petrol, produce diesel, we cannot produce, our refineries are shut, and all those working there are rich men, millionaires with the best buildings in the township and in their local villages. And they are models of success for the young people. So the only way to grow in Nigeria is to capsize the state, steal as much as you can, and if possible, have a second home outside Nigeria. Now nobody can go for medical treatment. All those who have cases in the courts, they were asking for adjournments for, to go on medical treatment abroad. <laughs> Nobody can go. We have to treat our coronavirus uh, disease, COVID-19 here. Yeah. We have to treat it here. This is a tragedy. But sometimes tragedies happen in history in order to shock you into consciousness and to re-motivate you to turn to the correct direction. The greatest lesson of COVID-19 is if it will bring better leadership, a sense of direction, the radical activation of our latent potentialities, and the changing of our recognition models. What are you noted for? What you can contribute to this? Chief Nyamudo, the present general of Ohanez and Debo. That was quite an excursion into the good old days and a barrage of very useful ideas and suggestions for us and of course for our leaders going forward after this pandemic. On behalf of the Deputy Director of Programs Radio Nigeria South East Zone, Gregory Odiakosa, who ran that brilliant interview, the studio manager has been Ema Wobodo and this production was by Gregory Odiakosa. I am Piogo with Ezechi, thanking you for listening and urging you to stay home, stay safe and by all means, be alive.